Amen. Let's take our Bibles tonight and open up to the book of Song of Solomon. Anyone know what chapter we're in? Four, right. Does that mean we've done chapters one, two, and three already? Wow. After tonight, we'll be halfway through this amazing uh, book. I hope you're enjoying this study. It's quite a, quite a delightful book, really. It's very fascinating. And um, we're trying to uh, make a few applications on our way through. Well, let's see. Uh, we got the, there we go, the Song of Solomon. So, all right, let's ask the Lord to bless our study. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this wonderful book called the Bible. And here, just about in the middle of it, we find this real love letter. Help us tonight to learn. Please, Holy Spirit, speak with our hearts. Show us the Father's love and, and the Savior's love for us. It's so true. God is love. And we can only love him because he first loved us. We wouldn't know what love is, dear Father, if it wasn't for Jesus, if it wasn't for this blessed old book. Please help us tonight undertake for our frailty and our humanness, our short-sightedness. Speak with our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I just want to uh, remind you all that the uh, outline, the kind of rough outline uh, for uh, this Sort of a basic overview, if you will. I got from Dr. Harry Ironside in his commentary, and he sort of gives the background on the book, uh, Song of Solomon. And I'm just going to race through it here. But King Solomon had a vineyard in the hill country of Ephraim, about 50 miles north of Jerusalem. He led it out to keepers consisting of a mother, two sons, and two daughters, one of them being the Shulamite. She ends up being the bride, and she has a little sister. The Shulamite was like the Cinderella of the family, naturally beautiful but unnoticed. Her brothers were likely half-brothers. They made her work very hard tending the vineyards, and so she had little opportunity to care for her own personal appearance. She pruned the vines and set traps for the little foxes. She also kept the flocks. Uh, being out in the open so much, she became sunburned. One day, a handsome stranger came to the vineyard. It was Solomon, disguised. He showed an interest in her, and she became embarrassed concerning her personal appearance. She took him for a shepherd and asked about his flocks. He answered evasively, but also spoke loving words to her and promised rich gifts for the future. He won her heart and left with the promise that someday he would return. She dreamed of him at night and sometimes thought he was near. Finally, he did return in all his kingly splendor to make her his bride. And so just a little reminder for you as to where all this is going. And so we come to chapter 4. And uh, there we go. That's our study tonight. Now, uh, in chapter 4 here, we have essentially the consummation of the marriage. Uh, at this point, they're now uh, husband and wife. And the, uh, the verses might be considered a little bit graphic, so we want to be very careful here in our commentary. But at this point, Solomon and his bride are now married. They are husband and wife. And so our outline is going to look something like this. Here we are. We've got God speaking. Um, Solomon. Remember that we said that it's, it's more than just a love letter, a sonnet between a man and a woman. It goes beyond that. And many, many conservative Bible teachers see a great parallel between the, the love between God and his people. The love between Solomon and his bride, the Shulamite, but the love between God and his people. And uh, many uh, hundreds of books have been written on the subject of Song of Solomon. And some of them are really kind of strange and funny and weird, but most of them really have a lot of good things to say. 
And so um, uh, if we're saved, if we're God's people, then this applies to us too. And of course, the scriptures indicate that we are the bride of Christ. Christ is God, our Savior here. And um, so anyhow, in these verses, we have, uh, let's see if we can do this. There we are. Solomon describes her physical beauty. And so uh, chapter four, verse one, behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove's eyes within thy locks. Thy hair is as a flock of goats that appear from Mount Gilead. Um, back in the seventies, when I got saved in 1975, <clears throat> I guess about a year later, something like that, I discovered the book of the song of Solomon. And I thought, boy, there's some interesting descriptions there. And I remember the man who was the, the pastor of the little church I was attending. He, um, he thought some of these descriptions were rather humorous. He thought they were sort of funny how a Solomon compared his wife there to uh, different animals and things. And that how her, her hair kind of looked like a, a flock of goats. And he sort of found that humorous. Now, for those of us who are, you know, the super spiritual types, you know, we, we don't find that funny at all. Uh, I remember hearing about a book. I have yet to find it, but it's called The Humor of Christ. And I think it was written back in the 60s, maybe, or something like that. And um, apparently this man was having a Bible study in his home with a group of his friends. And uh, one of his children was nearby. And so uh, the, the passage they were studying was um, in the Sermon on the Mount, how Jesus talked about having, uh, like taking a little tiny speck out of someone's eye, but having a big beam in your own eye. Do you know that passage I'm referring to? All you Bible readers, you'd know that. Well, the man all of a sudden heard his little child. His little child uh, uh, had been listening to this and burst out laughing, thought that was so funny. Ha a man walking around with a great big beam in his eye. And he thought that was so funny. And, and the man, you know, noticed his uh, little boy there was laughing away at that. And he got thinking about it. Yeah, I guess it is kind of funny, you know, when you think about it. And so that led him to write this book called The Humor of Christ. Interesting, isn't it? So this man, that was my uh, uh, spiritual uh, leader there, I can remember the expression on his face and how he would laugh and uh, saying about uh, her hair being like a, a whole bunch of goats, a whole flock of goats. So um, interesting, but Solomon talks about her eyes and her hair. He says that her eyes are like dove's eyes. Do you have that picture of the... I got a picture here, I think, for you. Somewhere there, there's a dove. There's a dove's eye. Uh, there's a few different types of doves, but uh, they, they often have this almond shaped, and they're often very dark, very black. And I think that uh, when he was comparing his wife's eyes to dove's eyes, I think that he was saying that they were very beautiful. Um, something interesting uh, about... Uh, uh, the Hebrew word for dove is Jonah. How about that, Elvin? Jonah means dove. Um, and the idea there, uh, in Hebrew anyhow, it means to hold firmly. To hold firmly. And it suggests that he was captivated with his wife's eyes. Um, it's amazing how a woman can actually get a man's attention with her eyes. The book of Proverbs has to, uh, something or other to say about that as well. Sometimes some of the, um, the not-so-nice girls that go out, you know, and stand on a corner at night looking for men. Um, Solomon talked about, you know, her catching the man with, with her eyelids. Interesting thought, isn't it? Well, anyhow, here Solomon was very, very captivated by his wife's eyes. And then uh, he talks about her hair uh, and he compares it to a flock of goats. So I, su I suggest to you that maybe what he means by that is that her hair was beautiful and flowing, uniform and flowing. Now I found something. Do you have that YouTube? Okay, I found a flock of goats for you. Put up the flock of goats. All right, let her run. Run. 
哋揸正手歸啦，我哋。There's, I don't know, thousand. Isn't that interesting? All a flock of goats. So it's just,、um, I just thought you might like to see that, because how many of us get to see a flock of goats? I couldn't find a flock of goats from Mount Gilead here in verse one, but I did find a, a flock of goats on on the number one highway here for you. So. There you go. That's what the flock of goats looks like. Well,、um, let's go back to the,、uh, the the outline there. There we go. So he's describing her beauty. Now, verse two: Thy teeth. Now he's talking about her teeth. Are like a flock of sheep that are even shorn, which came up from the washing, whereof every one bare twins, and none is barren among them. How many married men are here tonight? Raise your hand. Don't be ashamed. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right. Is that all the men that raised their hand? All of the married men. All right. Okay, you men. Have you ever said to your wife that her teeth are like a flock of sheep that are even shorn, which came up from the washing, whereof every one bare twins, and none is barren among them? When was the last time you used that line on your wife? Ernie, how many years you've been married? Fifty-three. You ever used that line before? Can't remember. Fifty-three <laughs> years. Wow. All right, Dennis. Any. But did you ever use that line? Did you ever look her in the eye and tell her about her teeth? Talk about her teeth? You know, I can't say I have ever. <laughs> it's、uh, it's quite a a thing to say, isn't it? Here about her teeth. Maybe it has something to do with her smile. A lot of men are captivated by their wife's smile. And I remember asking a husband、uh, a couple years ago, "What was the first thing you ever noticed about your wife when you first saw her?" And he thought, and he said, "Her smile." And、uh, that's very true. That a woman's smile can be very inviting. Maybe also she brushes her teeth. Maybe it has something to do with that as well. Now I have another little movie to show you, and of course it's the sheep. <laughs> it's kind of half the picture. You got okay. Let her let her rip. Here are the sheep. They're going for a wash. Now, unfortunately, that's all I got. I don't have them coming up the other side for you. Ah,、oh, there, Bessie, move along there. There we go. Isn't that something? All those sheep. So you, at least you get to see them go down in the water. At least that. But I don't have a picture of them coming up. I tried. I really did. And I tried to find these things for you. Okay, let's go on to verse three. Thy lips. So he now talks about her lips and her temples here. Thy lips are like a thread of scarlet, and thy speech comely. Thy temples are like a piece of pomegranate within thy locks.、Uh, I, pr- probably you had to be there, you know, to really appreciate this and grow up in that kind of culture. But he finds her lips and speech and temples very attractive. Verse four. Uh, he talks about her neck. Thy neck is like the tower of David, builded for an armory, whereon there hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. I, how romantic does that sound to you? You know, I'm I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt. I think that maybe in that culture, like that, really meant something. Maybe that was、uh, was much more romantic in Hebrew. You know, three thousand years ago. Then it sounds in English today, <laughs> but、um, apparently、uh, he fa- he thinks that her neck is very graceful from the look of it, and、uh, having a graceful neck、uh, that that's a nice compliment.、Uh, verse five: Thy two breasts are like two young roes that are twins, which feed among the lilies. You say, "Woo!" Well, remember they're married now. Okay, this is not talk between two unmarried people. They're married now, so he's allowed to say that. But he even finds her her bosoms attractive. All right, verse six: Until the day break and the shadows flee away, I will get me to the to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. Now, there's a lot of 
people have read a lot of stuff into that. But I think what Solomon is expressing is his desire for the wedding bed together. And that's normal. When two people get married, you know, they, they look forward to that, that honeymoon night. Verse 7, thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. He says there's not even a blemish on her body. Verse 8, come with me from Lebanon. That's up north in northern Israel there. Uh, come with me from Lebanon, my spouse. With me from Lebanon. Look from the top of uh, Amana. Uh, from the top of Shinar and Hermon, from the lion's den, from the mountains of the leopard. And he's, he's inviting her basically, come with me, come with me. Verse 9, thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes, with one chain of thy neck. And so he's saying that she's having this ravishing effect on him and I guess the more he looks upon her and, you know, the more, you know, that he, he extols her beauty, uh, the more he feels just under her ravishing power. The word ravish means to seize and carry off. Now look again in verse one, when he says, behold, thou art fair, my love, behold, thou art fair, thou hast dove's eyes. And down here again in verse nine, um, Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes. Look at that. And so her eyes were, were, were beautiful to him. Now, something I'd like you to look at, keep your finger there and go back a few pages to Proverbs chapter 5. Go to Proverbs chapter 5. And Solomon is uh, from verse 15. He's... he's um, writing about uh, husbands and wives. And uh, verse 15, drink waters out of thine own cistern. And so he's admonishing the husbands here, you know, to, to have, um, to be a one woman man uh, over these verses here. And uh, verse uh, 18, rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Verse 19, let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe, let her breast satisfy thee at all times and be thou ravished always with her love. That means uh, let her seize you and carry you off. <laughs> let her love do that to you. Uh, allow her to do that to you. And so back in Song of Solomon, this is what he's expressing is that you've ravished me. You know, I'll follow you anywhere. You, know, you could ask me the, the world. Uh, there's that old movie, um, uh, what's it called there with Jimmy Stewart? Wonderful life. And uh, he's sort of dating the girl that he'll eventually marry. And uh, what was the girl's name? Anyone remember? No? Any remember his name? Oh, wait, no. His last name was um, uh, Bailey. Right. Remember that? Bailey's Building and Loan. How many have ever seen the movie Wonderful Life? Three hands. Five. Four hands. Okay, well, that answers that. Anyhow, he, uh, he says to her, uh, uh, whatever her name was, I forgot her name. Doreen, Dora, I, I don't know, I forgot. You know, well, what do you want, Dora? What do you want? You want the moon? He said, I'll just throw a lasso around it. And I'll just pull it down and, you, and I'll give it to you. And it's just that idea that here he was kind of taken up, caught up in, in uh, this wonderful girl. And so here's the, the husband of the wife. And uh, this guy is absolutely ravished by her. And it's their wedding night. And in verse 10, he says, how fair is thy love, my sister, my spouse, how much better is thy love than wine and the smell of thine ointments than all spices. Her love for him is better than any kind of wine. And her perfume really sends him to the moon. He is really uh, uh, up on cloud nine. She smells great. Verse 11 Thy lips, O my spouse, drop as the honeycomb. Honey and milk are under thy tongue, and the smell of thy garments is like the smell of Lebanon. And so it seems that he finds her, her kisses to be like honey and milk. And then he begins to praise her for something that we don't, um, that we don't think of too much today. But he begins to praise her for keeping herself pure keeping herself away from other men, keeping herself just for him. 
in verse 12. He says, a garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut, shut up, a fountain sealed. And so she kept herself like an enclosed garden or a fountain that is sealed. Verse 13, thy plants are an orchid of pomegranates, an orchard of pomegranates, sorry, with pleasant fruits, campfire with spikenard. And uh, he says that she's like a fruitful garden. Verse 14, spikenard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, with all the chief spices. So he compares her to a, a garden of spices. The whole, the whole idea here is the, the closing in, the security, the purity, if you will. In verse 15, he finishes by saying, a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters and streams from Lebanon. And so to Solomon, his wife is like a garden of fountains, like living waters, if you will. And so he has all these wonderful and marvelous things to say, uh, to, say to her in private. This is the, uh, the, the private conversation between a new husband and wife. And now, see, where are we here? We have our, uh, no, we've covered that. There we are. And now it's her turn. And she has just one thing to say, and that's in verse 16. So let's look at it. Awake, she says, awake, O north wind, and come thou south. Blow upon my garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. And so after hearing all of his praises for her, She's very confident. She's very motivated. She wants Solomon and invites him to intimacy together. Now, remember, these folks are now married. So they got a license to say these things to each other, right? Now, let's conclude this chapter here. All this sounds rather sensual. So how does any of this apply to the relationship between God and his people? How in the world... Do we get any kind of application out of what appears to be um, an X-rated or forbidden conversation? Something that maybe should just stay in the, the bedroom there between husband and wife. Well, I have at least two observations for you tonight. The first observation has to do with intimacy. Intimacy. The marriage bed is the most intimacy that a married couple will ever have. The marriage bed. It's spoken of in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Likewise, the prayer closet is the most intimacy that a Christian on earth can have with God. The prayer closet. Now, it's normal for married couples to share a married bed, a marriage bed. If they don't, there, there could be something wrong. Now, I understand that there's times in life where they have to um, sort of exist separately, maybe even sleep in separate rooms, perhaps for some medical reason or something like that or some other reason but normally that doesn't happen normally the married couple they share the marriage bed and so normally if they don't do that something is probably wrong likewise it's normal for a Christian and God to share a prayer closet and if they don't something may be wrong Does that make sense it ought to it is a normal thing for you and I to go and have intimacy, spiritual intimacy with our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a normal, natural thing. And Jesus even told us in the New Testament, uh, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut the door, meet with thy father, which is in secret. And thy father, which heareth in secret, shall reward thee openly. And so there's just room for you and the Lord in the prayer closet. And that ought to be a normal activity. Just like when married people, a normal activity was, you know, at the end of the day, they, they go to bed. That's a normal activity for married couples. And it should be a normal activity for Christians every day to get alone with the Lord Jesus in the prayer closet. And if they don't do that, something could be wrong. And so the question is, do you and I have spiritual intimacy with our Savior every day? And if not, why not? 
So that's observation number one. Observation number two has to do with beauty. A husband normally finds his wife beautiful in various ways. As Solomon found his wife beautiful and talked about her eyes and her hair and her teeth and, you know, different parts of her. And uh, in fact, he didn't even find a spot within her. And so um, that's a normal thing for a husband to find his wife beautiful. But she makes herself beautiful for him. Um, It's normal for women to take time and take the care to make themselves attractive for their husbands. That's normal. There's nothing wrong with that. That's very normal. But if she doesn't work to make herself beautiful, she's not giving her husband all the joy that she could be giving him. So maybe she makes herself look beautiful until he marries her. And then afterwards, then everything just goes out the window. I saw in the news, uh, it happened in in, uh, China. Yeah, maybe it was uh, two years ago that it happened now. But this man fell in love with this very attractive Chinese lady and uh, dated her and married her. And then uh, the next day, uh, saw her without her makeup. And he didn't know her, didn't recognize her. And so he had a fit when he found out that uh, what she looked like without makeup on and what she looked like with makeup on, they were so different that she, the man actually went to court to divorce her over that. And the judge granted it because the judge thought or said or declared that she was using deception to marry him. So I don't know. That's all just too crazy for me. But that was in the news. You could look that up when you go home. But it's really bizarre. But the guy actually divorced her because she looked so different. Now, you know, that's not for us to to judge. Uh, That's a sad thing when that kind of stuff happens. When you marry someone, you're marrying a person more than a, you know, a can of spray paint or a, you know, bottle of whatever, you know. You're marrying a person. And uh, by the way, people change too. And over the years, uh, we change uh, physically and uh, emotionally and um, all kinds of changes. And skin texture and everything you can think of. Uh, Things change. So you marry the person more than you do, um, you know, the, the physical body. You're marrying the person in there. But it's, uh, it's normal for a wife to make herself attractive for her husband. And if she doesn't do that, if she doesn't take the time and the care to make herself look attractive for her husband, she's not giving her husband all of the joy that, that maybe he needs or, or could have. Likewise, Christians need to work at making themselves beautiful for Jesus Christ. You say, well, how do we do that? I'll show you. If you turn back to the book of Psalms, Psalm 29. Now I'll get you to read out a verse out loud together with me. Would you do that, please? Psalm 29 and verse 2. Psalm 29, verse 2. Let's read this out loud together now. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And so we can see what's beautiful to God. And what is it? What is it? Can't hear you. Holiness, right. You say it too quickly for me. I think I'm getting older. You say it too quickly, it sounded like horse. Like horses or something like that. It's be- it's, the beauty is the holiness. Holiness is beautiful. And if holiness is beautiful, what would be the opposite of holiness? Sin. Okay. <laughs> so if holiness is beautiful, sin is what? Ugly. Right. Ugly. Uh, years ago, I, I had a cousin. He's dead now. But when he was just a boy in school, he had this test to write. And the test was on uh, different things. You're supposed to give the opposites. And he was given like night and he had to put day. 
and hot, and he had to put cold, and all the opposites. And so on this one of them uh, was the word uh, sweet. And so uh, he put ugly. And anyhow, his mother later was looking over his test paper, and of course he got it wrong. And uh, she said to him, well, you know the opposite to sweet is sour. And he says, oh, I was thinking of girls at the time. (laughs) So um, the opposite of holiness is sin, and the opposite of beautiful, I guess, is ugly. So if holiness is beautiful, sin is ugly. And uh, therefore, holiness ought to be our goal. And just as a man's wife needs to take the time and make herself attractive for her husband, so the Christian needs to take the time and make himself or herself attractive for their Savior. And the beauty that's spoken of here is holiness. And sins and bad habits are like spots and blemishes, and they don't look so good. Now, let's go to the New Testament, shall we? Over to the book of Ephesians, and we're going to finish there. Ephesians and chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 is a marvelous chapter. It deals with uh, several things, including husbands and wives. But uh, the, the main teaching in the chapter, well, in fact, the whole book, it's on our relationship with Jesus Christ. And Paul in this chapter really, really nails it here. Chapter 5 of Ephesians. Everybody there? So I'm going to get your help here and we'll read a few verses from verse 22 to verse 27. So we'll start at 22, finish at 27. Let's read this out loud. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now, I want you to note here the need for God's word in your life. Look at in verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, without the Bible being preached, and teached, and read, and listened to, and studied, and memorized without the Bible, we're not going to become very pretty in the eyes of our Savior. We must have the Word of God. It's important that we use the Word of God every day. And that's where your prayer closet is really going to shine for you. You get alone with the Lord And uh, you read through a few chapters of the Word of God, and then you go to prayer. That reading of the Word of God has this washing effect. If you have a problem in your thought life, the Word of God will help wash away any words, any thoughts, any pictures, whatever shouldn't be up there. The Word of God will help to cleanse it and wash it away. Wow, that's good news for someone. The word of God, the scriptures, you need to hear the Bible taught. You need to hear the Bible preached. You need to hear the Bible read. You need to read the Bible yourself. You need to try and memorize some of the Bible. You need to do Bible studies. You need to just dive into the word and ask the Lord to direct you and and show you things and, and help you swim within the word of God. Because it's the word of God that's going to make you holy. And it's going to wash away every spot and every blemish. And what did we just finish reading? Solomon, he said about his wife, he says, there's not even a spot. He was so thrilled and amazed with his wife. Well, is the Lord Jesus so thrilled and amazed with us? Are we having intimacy with him on a a daily basis in our prayer closets? And number two, 
Are we working at making ourselves beautiful in his sight? Which means holiness. That means that we've got to make sure that the music we listen to is not filthy and worldly. We have to make sure that the things that go in our eyes and go in our ears are not filthy and worldly. We have to make sure that there are no bad habits and sinful habits. Things that we're just say, oh, well, that's, you know, that's just me. Hey, I've tried giving it up. I can't. Eh, that's just the way I am. Oh, no, no. Those spots and those blemishes need to be washed away. And it's the word of God that can do that. Well, it ought to be our goal. Our goal in life should not be, listen carefully, our goal should not be a comfortable lifestyle, a nice retirement, an easy death. That should not be our goal ever in life. Our goal in life should be to become holy in the sight of our Savior so that he will be filled with love and praises for us when we finally get home to meet him. That ought to be our goal, to beautify ourselves, getting rid of every spot, every wrinkle, every blemish, so that everything about us is absolutely gorgeous and beautiful in his sight. Christian, are you making yourself holy and pure for your coming Savior, Jesus? Good question.